Well, good morning to you, and thanks for tuning in to our online service. It's been a couple of weeks now since I did a recording for the online talks. That's because I was away on holiday, and thanks for all your prayers with regard to that. I had a good time, so much appreciated. And what I want to do over these next few weeks is have a short series on loving God, loving each other, and loving the lost in our community. So that's our kind of base fundamental mandate phrase, you could say. And I think really September's can kind of be New Year's for churches. September seems to be a sort of a starting a fresh thing. So I wanted at the very beginning just to look at that phrase. And today we're going to specifically be looking at loving God and what that really means. But it seems to me that one of the most important things for a church is to know why we exist. And that phrase, loving God, loving each other and loving lost people, I think is principally what we're really meant to be about. So loving God today and we'll see where we get to. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you so much for your majesty, your greatness and your goodness. That even when life itself throws its worst at us, you still remain you. Thank you for the hope we have in you. And we would ask this day that as we look at the story of Mary and Martha, we would begin to see some special things in there from you about what it means to truly love you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now, I really like the story of Mary and Martha. It's five verses, that's all it is. But they are big verses with huge implications, I think, for our Christian lives. And so to make things simpler, really, I just want to look at the characters of Martha and Mary in that order and to see some of the things that I think are there in the text, really. So that's what we're going to do. Break it up into two parts in that kind of way. So first things first then, Martha, number one, Martha. Let me ask you, have you ever had a massive Christmas meal with lots of family members coming round? Guess you have. Have you ever had a wider, kind of larger family kind of get together, perhaps for a 90th birthday or something like that? Maybe that's been your experience. But have you? ever experienced trying to prepare food for a very large gathering. Maybe you've done that because holding something and actually being the one preparing may not necessarily be the same thing. Well, imagine this then. Imagine Jesus is coming to your house. Well, if he was, I'd like to think that you'd find that pretty kind of, oh, We've got to get ourselves sorted out here, kind of feeling within yourself. What would you do? I suspect, like me, you'd probably end up doing exactly what Martha was doing in her home. And Martha, as we see from the text, was going absolutely mad. She was rushing around, rushing around the house, trying to get everything prepared. She was distracted by all the preparations that she had to make. Verse 40. And that word distracted is actually quite a bit more potent, you could say, than just what it reads in its own self. Distracted literally means to be dragged all around within yourself. In other words, it's a bit like you're being pulled apart, stretched apart in all sorts of directions, being pulled in all sorts of directions because of the amount of things you've got to do. It's kind of being distracted with cumber and care to be drawn away within oneself and to be greatly troubled. That's what Martha was really experiencing. That was the state she was in. So have you ever been there? I'm sure you have been in your life many times. But with all that said, actually, Martha, what was she doing? She was actually only doing what she was supposed to be doing. It's easy to suddenly read the text, I guess, in a bit of a negative light towards Martha. And there is an element of that, but in a different way. But actually on the practical level of what she was doing, she was only doing what she's supposed to be doing. This is what Martha knew. 
This was her cultural expression. This is, was this was the social norm in which she lived. That's what women did in those days. And as a woman, she was socially marginalised. She knew that and she accepted that and she got on with her role. So on a cultural level, a social level, you could say Martha wasn't doing anything wrong. So what's this about? Enter Mary. Now Mary in the story is just sitting there. That's what she's doing. I mean, she's sitting there with Jesus in her house. How could she just sit there when he is present? And you can imagine what's going through Martha's mind, really. She'd be thinking the same. How can you just sit there, Mary? You know your role. You know that socially speaking, you should be up and about, not sitting at his feet, but on your own feet, doing some work. Mary, you know that by doing nothing, you are breaking all social boundaries and cultural norms. Mary, you're gonna bring shame on this house by not doing what you should be doing. And she could be thinking as well, Mary, what do you think Jesus is thinking about what you're doing? If anyone knows that you should be doing this kind of work with me, it is him. So pull your finger out. Get on with it. And so inflamed was she that she even then said this, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me! Exclamation mark, verse 40b. So how about that? She even raised her voice at Jesus, which is a pretty significant thing to do, I think. So here's the question, another question. Is Mary really so in the wrong? From a strictly social, cultural point of view, well, yes, she is. But ABC, this is about Jesus. And this is about what it means to love our God. You see, what Mary is actually doing in these moments is most profound. And I'd just like to relay some of those to you now. As Mary sits at Jesus' feet, just imagine this. She is looking into Jesus' face. And he is looking into her face. Face. There's this relational, face-to-face -face kind of intimate closeness going on. So it's very deep, this. And as she does so, Mary enters into Christ's presence. So she sees his face, she sees his eyes, and she listens to his voice. And it's most likely that she doesn't say a lot herself. She simply waits, she listens, and she waits on her Lord, on who he really is. And in those moments of just being there, in that special connection, she receives from him. Mary is sure that she can receive from Jesus all her needs. They can be met by him. She totally trusts him for everything. She depends on him and she knows that he accepts her. In fact, she did not initially go to Jesus. After all, Jesus came to her because he entered her home. He sought her out because he wanted to be with her and Martha. Now that's a real thought. Jesus seeking them out. So Christ offers Mary freedom in that little house of hers in Bethany, and he offers her freedom from fear. But here is a shocking thing, a bit of a shock in that culture. It was only ever men who would sit at a teacher's feet. And this was the place for a male disciple. That's what a male disciple would do. 8 verse 35 makes that clear. So Mary's acting like a man. 
She's acting like a male disciple. And what does this mean? It means this, that male or female, all are equally welcome to come into the presence of Jesus and sit at his feet. So then you could say we have a Mary approach to Jesus and a Martha approach to Jesus. All I do know is this, is the Mary approach is one that is about the real, actual person of Jesus. And it's about making Jesus primary in her life and our lives. Mary loves him. Mary is consumed by Jesus. She wants him above all else. Everything is second place to him. And so it should be. And the secondary, of course, is what Martha was focusing on. And that's the issue here at the heart of the passage. So this is what it means to love God. Loving God is to seek out Jesus and to let him seek us out. Seek me out, you out. It's about desire. It's about truly wanting him and to spend proper time with him. This is about the development of the deepest and most special of all relationships. Something that both Mary and Jesus wanted and something obviously we should want from Jesus as Jesus wants from us. But I do think there's something else in this passage. And, you know, I'll be honest with you, I'd never thought of this before, but I was out praying just the other day and this sort of just popped in my head. And I think it's something the Lord wants to show us a little bit more about in this passage. And it's all based on the book of Ruth. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the phrase kinsman redeemer from the book of Ruth? I'm sure many of you have. Well, Ruth in the book of Ruth, of course, was penniless and poor. She had nothing left, literally nothing left. And that's because of some very difficult life circumstances that she had gone through. As that is so, Naomi, her mother-in-law, sent her into some fields belonging to a man called Boaz. Now, Boaz was rich. He was a wealthy man and a relative of Naomi as well. And the hope was this, that by going into his fields, Ruth might meet Boaz and he would then honour the Old Testament law and take care of her. Because that's what she so desperately needed in the situation of being penniless and poor. So that's the first bit. But later in the story, what is it we discover? We see Ruth laying where? At the feet of Boaz, chapter three, verse seven. And there it is, a little extra link for today. As Mary sits at Jesus's feet, she is proclaiming, here is my symbolic Boaz. In other words, like Boaz was before to Ruth, Jesus is the kinsman redeemer to Mary. How about that, my friends? Mary is saying, like Ruth before her, I know I cannot rescue myself. I know I'm poor. I know I'm needy. But Jesus, as my kinsman redeemer, is the one who's going to protect me. Jesus is the one who covers me, redeems me and sets me free. Yes, Jesus is the one who's going to take me in my spiritual poverty and make me rich. That's what I think Mary also understood by doing what she was doing. And that is why Jesus has got to be first place in everything. And as the story goes on, we find something else that Boaz actually finally marries Ruth. And so we can also say this by extension, and I, I, I feel Mary is also saying Jesus is my spiritual husband from Isaiah 54 verse 5. He is my bridegroom, John 3, 29. Indeed, the whole church, as in the church at the very end, is the bride of Christ, as we know. And one day Jesus will spiritually marry us who are his true church. Revelation 19, 7. 
I hope you feel these are amazing parallels between the Old and the New Testament, where we see all these things fulfilled fully, completely and totally in the person of Christ. And here's something else, more remarkable, I think. If Boaz had not married Ruth, then there would have been no future lineage from which King David would have come. And because of that, if that had happened, there'd have been no lineage for Jesus himself to be born either. So we praise God for his sovereign plans. And feet, what about those feet? Well, feet in the Bible often symbolise strength, power, might and triumph. Revelation 1.15 talks about feet like burnished bronze glowing in a fire or furnace. So Mary sits before the one with those feet because in Revelation 1 that's we're talking about Jesus in that passage. So she sits right next to the feet which symbolise divinity, power and might. But the remarkable thing that I find most astounding of all is that Jesus wants her to sit there. He opens himself up to her, his humanity and his divinity. Yes, she sits at those feet, the very feet under which Satan will be crushed. Romans 16 verse 20. I think, my friends, this is the relationship to which he calls every single true Christian. Jesus Christ welcomes you and he wants you to know him in this intimate and close way. You know, ultimately, I think it comes down to a choice, really. A choice between the Mary way, you could say, and the Martha way, which I'll slightly elaborate on in a moment. If we are to truly love God, then I think it starts with a true hunger within us for him. It starts by being like Mary, eager for Jesus above all else, because Christianity, Christian living, church life, church ministry, all of it will totally fail unless we first love Christ and know him. So I guess you could say we must first sit at his feet so that we can then stand up on our feet and walk and go and do what he wants us to do. It should never be the other way around. Thinking of Martha for a moment, for the contrast I said, Martha is a do, do, do person. We can be like her, I think, I know I can. We can perform, always trying to perform, and perfect things, getting everything organised for Jesus, perhaps dictating his schedule and way of doing things, trying to run everything smoothly for Jesus, and almost not even notice he's in the room because we are so busy. In fact, Martha presumed to tell Jesus what to do, whereas Mary let Jesus tell her what to do. Simply then, Martha is a doer with very little relationship with Christ. Oh Lord, I say, let it be. We are always the Mary types in that we always seek Jesus first. You see, in a way, we're not meant to be working for Christ, but instead be his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10. And I think there's a subtlety in there. But that can only come, I think, when we are like Mary's, being dependent on him, waiting on him in prayer, listening and being still at his feet. So to sum it up really in a way you could say, being must always precede doing. And it's very hard to get that right sometimes, I think. And I think also, that if our being always precedes the doing, we will always find that everything that needs to get done will get done anyway. ABC, this is also about what it means to love. God, the foundation from which all else will flow and follow. So, Martha, Martha, a gentle, kind rebuke from Jesus. Don't be worried about the many things, verse 41, because only one thing really matters, and that one thing is Jesus. 9 verse 35 calls him the chosen one. He is the one 
that really matters. And he's not going to be taken from Mary, verse 42. In closing, then I could say this. Martha might have been making bread in the kitchen. But what she really needed to understand was this, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Luke 4, verse 4. And that is why we need Jesus, who is the word. John 1, verse 1. Let us then, ABC, love our God, increasingly spending time with him, so that all we do comes from the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, let, it not, let it not be that we end up doing things in church life because that's what we think church should be doing or doing things in our Christian lives because we think, well, that's what it should look like. No, it's really important we get the sort of horse before the cart, so to speak, and not get things the wrong way around. It's so important we start with Jesus always, listening to him, following him, so that our church ministries are all about him and what he wants to do through them. Glory to his name. Glory to God in the Most High. Amen. Thanks for your time today, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Mm -hmm.